In our last episode, we discussed the evidentiary significance of voluntary intoxication. This time, our topic is involuntary intoxication. The facts of Regina versus Kingston are these. The defendant is charged with sexually abusing a young man. The defendant wants to raise an affirmative defense of involuntary intoxication. He admits the conduct, but there is evidence that he was slipped a mickey and a cup of coffee by the person who introduced the victim to the defendant. The drug was disinhibiting, Kingston would like the fact finder to know. Illicit desires that he normally had under control were unleashed, not because he knowingly got drunk or took drugs, but because unbeknownst to him, a disinhibiting drug was put in his coffee. The court in Kingston is unwilling to allow the defense not because it lacks merit, but because of fears that the defense is too easy to abuse. In the field of road traffic, the spiked drink is a regular feature. Transferring opportunities for a spurious defense is a disturbing prospect. The model penal code, unlike Kingston, is willing to trust the courts and the fact finder to sort out spurious defenses from the genuine ones. It provides intoxication, which is not self-induced or is pathological. Pathological intoxication would, for example, exist if the defendant suffered unexpected side effects from a medication. Both are cases of involuntary intoxication, which is an affirmative defense. If by reason of such intoxication, the actor at the time of his conduct lacks substantial capacity either to appreciate its criminality or to conform his conduct to the requirements of law. Notice that this subsection creates an affirmative defense, which is additional to whatever mens rea defenses the defendant might assert. For example, Although voluntary intoxication normally cannot negate the awareness component of recklessness, involuntary intoxication can. In other words, it is only the voluntarily intoxicated defendant who is deemed to be aware of what she would have been aware of if sober. In Kingston's case, he had no mens rea defense. He knew full well what he was doing, but under the model penal code, he would have an affirmative defense if his intoxication deprived him of substantial capacity either to know that what he was doing was criminal or to conform to what the law requires. In other words, there is an affirmative defense available both to those whose ability to know the wrongfulness of their conduct is diminished and to those who know but cannot stop themselves. The language here, as we shall see next time, is very close to the language of the Model Penal Code definition of legal insanity. Let's look at loss of control from another angle. Unfortunately, the use of secretly administered party drugs is a temptation to those, typically young men, who are not satisfied with what they can achieve romantically on the strength of personal charm alone. Let's explore a hypothetical case. Bert spikes Andrea's drink to get her to have sex with him. The drug has the desired effect. While under the influence of the drug, Andrea also steals Cynthia's laptop. Andrea would have done neither had she not been disinhibited by the drug. Question one. Can Bert be convicted of rape? The answer here is yes. According to the Model Penal Code special part, a male who has sexual intercourse with a female is guilty of rape if he has substantially impaired her power to appraise or control her conduct by administering, without her knowledge, drugs or intoxicants for the purpose of preventing resistance. But suppose now we ask, can Andrea be convicted of theft? Under Kingston, the answer is yes. 
a drugged intent is still an intent. Under the model penal code? Yes, again, unless Andrea can show that she had lost substantial capacity to conform to the law. That's a different kettle of fish from substantial impairment of ability to appraise Bert's allurements or resist his advances. These are different capacities altogether. There's no inconsistency in convicting Bert for rape and Andrea for theft.